you, Christian, so much. Okay, so um, hi, everyone, and thank you very much for coming today. Um, some of you here might not have ever heard about rich thinking research, and even if you have, I always like to go back and give you a bit of context before I start sharing this year's paper. Why did I start doing this research in the first place? Uh, I was working as a portfolio manager during the financial crisis, and I didn't have much fun at that time, as I'm sure any of you in the industry didn't, or even if you weren't in the industry, you probably didn't have much fun during that period. And what happened was I decided that some of my clients that I was speaking to, the ones that were panicky phone calls more, seemed to be more men than women. And I had about equal men and women. And so it was interesting to me because we've always heard that stereotype how women are risk averse and don't handle investments well and all of these old, old theories. And I thought, how strange that I'm getting more panicky calls from these male clients. So it sort of prompted me to think Think about what are these stereotypes and, and why have we as an industry more or less accepted them for so many years? So I came up with my big idea, which was to look into that. And I started reading absolutely everything I could find on bank websites, research consulting firms all around the world. And everything I read perpetuated the same stereotypes. I'm happy to say this was 2009 and things have shifted, thankfully. Um, so what happened is I got really mad about this and I thought, how can we counter stereotypes? How can we make it better for the next generation of women and men and a more realistic depiction of what everyday real life investors look like? So I came up with this idea that I would interview very accomplished women around the world and share positive real life stories. And so that could act as a way of possibly countering all of these silly stereotypes. And it's actually had an impact. So by now I've interviewed 800 smart women, lots of smart men too, all ages, all backgrounds, all different professions and countries. So I think at 800, this research is starting to be st significant statistically as well. And I'm, I'm actually going to celebrate the 10th year, year of uh, anniversary of Rich Thinking with my next paper out on International Women's Day, March 2020. And I'm going to do a, a more thorough quantitative survey to study the decade that I've been doing that. That's sort of my own little celebration. So with that backdrop, today I want to share this year's paper, which came out International Women's Day 2019. And for this paper, I interviewed 50 accomplished women around the world, and I asked them three questions. What's the biggest idea you've ever had in your life? What did you do about that idea? And how did you invest in that idea? and I got a bunch of interesting answers. And one thing I can tell you that I'm very happy about is every single woman I asked had had at least one big idea. And I'm gonna spend some time today talking about the implications of this research. So why should we care that every woman has a big idea? It's certainly important for the investment industry and I'll go into a little bit of that with you. And then I'll share some trends about what I'm seeing going on globally with women and money today, because it's pretty exciting. As I said, since I started this, things have shifted a lot and it's just way, way better in terms of depicting real life female investors. So as well as rich thinking research, I do other stuff because rich thinking is self-financed and I no longer work in the industry. So I do commissioned research and project work mainly for banks and investment firms around the world, largely doing similar interview style things, mainly with CEOs and that's a very fun. So I worked with Danske Bank in the Nordics, uh, State Street, a, a few venture capital firms in North America, and that's been my life for the past three years or so, and traveling. And so this study, again, came out in March of 2019. If you would like to read it, unfortunately, I couldn't bring everybody a hard copy. Um, you can go on my site, barbarastewart.ca, and every single white paper I've ever written is on there, and you just download it for free and be inspired by all of these quotes and stories. This year, I decided I'll ask a few quant questions of all of the women that I interviewed. Welcome. 
And I was really curious to know where did these women get these big ideas? Because I get my big ideas when I'm out for a run, always. I'm out of my run and something just pops into my head. Sometimes I'm in the bathtub. Occasionally I'll get an idea in the bathtub. I don't know why just relaxed, whatever it is. But I was interested to find out that most people got their big idea when they were busy at their official job. So they're sitting there doing whatever they're being paid to do, and they come up with some new idea and it takes them off into a different direction. A lot of people get their ideas when they're reading, reading something else. And the age, some get their ideas in their 20s, some get them in their 50s, but by far the majority age 30 to 40. My big idea for rich thinking wasn't until I was 49, so who knows. And then, when did you start working on it? You get this great idea. Most of them, I love this, started immediately, right away, as soon as they had the idea. So these smart women take action right away. And then how much money are they willing to put into it? Mine didn't cost much, just my travel costs and publishing a very nice document and website and stuff like that. But a lot of women, close to 30% of them, spent over $100,000 on their idea. And this is usually while they kept working for a while as well. So guess where that money comes from? It comes out of their retirement savings account more often than not. And we'll come back to that because that's a key factor of how important these ideas are to these women. So they came in three categories. It was hard. It's always hard for me. I do 50 interviews and then to put categories around them because there's a lot of overlap and different topics. But largely it was either seize the day, take advantage of something going on in the marketplace that had shifted. Okay, jump on that. That's the idea. Or it's something to fulfill my own talents and my own ambitions. Or these days, many, many people have the idea about the greater good. How can I help society, children, gender, whatever it is. And so I'll give you just a couple of examples. They're all from the book, so I'm hoping that you will go through them in detail. Um, one of my favorites was in Oslo. I met this Canadian woman who had moved there just to be with a boyfriend, Kate, Kate Murphy. She had no job. She was looking around. She had her MBA, not much to do. Randomly, uh, on a subway or a streetcar, she met the manager for Magnus Carlsen, who's the world champion chess expert. They had a very informal conversation. She ended up telling him that she thought she could make a 1,500-year-old sport into a world-class brand. She took it as just this idea, go on this site, Magnus Carlsen, it is now unbelievable. She's developed a, a global app that everybody's using. They are incredibly successful and they have essentially revolutionized chess as a world-class experience, just from a random conversation. Uh, this lady in Istanbul, she decided that her child wasn't doing well at age two, wasn't playing with other kids, wasn't talking. So she started studying early childhood education, even though that wasn't her field of interest or it, she was a business person. She got so inspired by the Montessori technique, again, another app. She designed, dropped everything, developed an app, spent a lot of money on it. They now, it's only been out six months, they have over 5,000 users all across Turkey. She wants to influence childcare, education. The app gives people ideas of what toys their kids should have based on their personality, based on their stage of development. No advertising, already successful. This lady is in Hong Kong. She used to be in the financial world in Toronto, and when they decided in Hong Kong to drop the tariffs on importing wine, she spotted an opportunity. And she said, hey, I've always loved the luxury wine market. I'm going to move back to Hong Kong and open a wine store. They won the wine, luxury wine store of the year in Hong Kong last year. Just happened. So here's what's going on with female inventors. A lot of women are scared of getting their ideas stolen too. This came across very loud and clear in the interviews. I think, you know, in the workplace, we've all had our ideas stolen from time to time. Well, when you finally get your big idea and you're spending your own money on it, it's a concern. So we've seen from 1990, patents filed by women, 12.2% back then. 
2017, 31.2%. So that's an encouraging sign. Now, these self-actualizing people. This lady, I love this story. I was in Chile. She ran ENY's accounting department, 35 partners, very serious. She decided, I'll go back at night and get my MBA because being a tax partner today, you have to know everything about everything, finance, all of it. Her first day in the MBA night class, she's sitting there. And the professor put up this question. He said, I'd like you to turn to the person beside you and answer this question before we have any classes. And so she was asked this question, if you're 10 times braver than you are today, what would you be doing? And it struck her, literally out of the blue, if I was 10 times braver, I would be a chef. She'd always loved cooking. She walks out of the MBA class, okay, maybe an hour later, and drops everything. She's now quitting her whole accounting profession and going to start her own restaurant. Love it. CSI effect. I ran into this lady in Las Vegas. I was sitting having dinner with my husband. I saw a table of about 15 women, one man. And I'm always curious when I see like a big table of women because of my area of research. But I'm also shy, believe it or not. And so I didn't want to go over and ask and disturb their evening. They were in hysterics. It was very fun, very entertainment oriented. So my husband kindly said, I'll go and ask them what they're doing. <laughs> so he goes over and he said, Jody knows my husband. She's come from Toronto. So he goes over and says, um, excuse me, my wife's a researcher and she's noticing you're all women. Do you mind me asking what you're doing here? And it turns out that they were all forensic scientists. And I ended up interviewing that lady the next morning, one of them. And she said that because of the CSI effect, she was going to go to medicine school, but she decided to go into forensics because it seemed so exciting. And in fact, in the crime unit in Vegas, in the DNA department, 30 of the 31 forensic scientists are women. So it shows us that, you know, a good TV show or any kind of role modeling, any kind of making it visual that women can do things and do jobs can have a serious impact. So I think the uh, obviously the CFA societies should pick up on this and we should get maybe a TV show. <laughs> so <clears throat> this lady, some ideas I found don't cost any money whatsoever. This lady, I was doing my annual photo shoot for my website and the photographer said, we'd like to take a picture of you actually in the middle of an interview. So I grabbed his assistant, which was her, and I said, okay, let me ask you some questions. So I asked her what was her best idea, because that was my question last year. And she said, well, I grew up in Egypt and then in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and I became very hard because it was so mis misogynist and oppressive, and I was this really mean, nasty person. And she said, when I moved to Toronto to go to photography school, um, I looked around one day and I realized, I, I don't have to be that mean here. Like, this is a really nice city and the people are being very nice to me. So her big idea was simple. Be kind to other people. And from then on, she shifted her life that way. So it's great. It's not a business, just an idea. And then these lovely people who all work for the greater good now, all kinds. This is a CFA charter holder, uh, Sandrine Rambo in Istanbul. She decided to put her financial skills to use when they had an influx of Syrian refuge refugees into Turkey. And they didn't have any financial skills. And it was clear that they're going to be there for the long term. So she wanted to help them build a sustainable community. So she's dropped everything and is working full time with them and has developed this entire uh, company, JANA Impact, with funding from European uh, Reconstruction and Development Bank. And then I had uh, the opportunity to go on CNN in, um, where was I? Chile. And the broadcaster was talking to me about her side project, which is Yoga Chile. They ask every corporation to donate to, sorry, take an hour yoga class and pay for it inside their premises. And then they donate one hour to the poor children in Chile because she believes yoga is a way of teaching children kindness, welcome, and changing the world. 
And then here we go. Why does all this matter? I mean, these are just some of the examples, but you can see how fun my work is walking around listening to these things. And I could have asked, I believe, any woman anywhere, this is just 50, and they all have some amazing idea. Either they've acted on it or they haven't, but they all have one. So I think obviously, because today's number one target market is this female customer, we have to understand better what she's thinking about, how she wants to be communicated with, why is she behaving the way she is? And the more we can understand this, the better a job we can all do, whether we're investment advisors, salespeople of absolutely anything, we all need to get better at this. So here's a really, really good example of, of why, if it isn't obvious yet. Uh, a couple of years ago, I interviewed Haken Nyberg, who at, the point, at that point was CEO of Nordnet, which is the largest internet bank in the Nordics. And he was telling me this story of how one week they decided to send out a hard copy, glossy brochure, even though they're an internet bank and everything was kind of paperless at the time. They wanted to make a splash because they had really wealthy clients at one end of the spectrum. And so they sent out this glossy brochure. It had nine men between the ages of 35 and 45 on it, all in business suits, all very handsome, really nice cover. He was at home on the weekend. He looked at his email on his phone. The subject heading was, what were you thinking? He looked at it. It was their wealthiest female customer, 64-year-old woman, really offended that the cover of this thing was like all these young men, no thought given to it. Wow, he changed the entire business. That was 2015. He told me the next day he hired McKinsey to come in and help them figure out a new strategy to get 50-50 in the workplace to mirror their client base, and they did it. Nordnet has that now, and they've done very well. So if you're in the business of any business and you want to get better at talking to female clients, you can have a look at any of these nine papers that I've done. As I said, I'm working on the 10th this year. If you can't think of how to communicate with a woman, ask them the questions that I ask them, because trust me, they all worked. I just ask one question a year on different topics, and they, they all want to talk about whatever I've asked them. So it's that simple, really, if you can't think of it. So just to give you some high-level findings, if you haven't followed the whole 10 years, these are sort of the key points that I've learned about women, that 73% of women prefer to learn about investment ideas or other ideas through informal discussions. They don't really want to sit down at a, at a class and be taught by an instructor anymore. Although obviously if you're in school, you have to. They would rather learn from friends, family, colleagues. What did you invest in? Why did you invest in that? What happened? Let's share some investment ideas. Let's get together via social media or in real life. Stories, that's it. That's what they want. So use case studies. Podcasts obviously are really important. Anything visual is appealing to the average woman. In 2013, which is now a long time ago, I asked this question of, it was 100 women that year, um, where are you investing your resources, your money? Where, I wanted to get a pie chart. And I found out interestingly in that year that over a quarter of them weren't investing in the traditional asset mix whatsoever because a woman's definition of investing is much broader than the traditional asset mix. They were investing in something that mattered to them. Women prefer to invest in causes and concerns that hold some meaning for them. So that's money, that's a pot of money that's not going into their retirement plan. And often I've found over the years that many investment advisors don't even ask about that money that's not in the core investment portfolio. And that concept 
is even more so with millennials and Gen Y women, because what they're doing, I hear over and over again, is they're planning, not so much for retirement, they're planning to design their lives. Everything fits into their life design and they're spending a lot of time on that. So those big ideas obviously factor into a life design and that can take money as well. I was here last year. This was probably my biggest slide last year. I always throw it up there because it's so important. And this, this lingo is, I'm happy I've been changing this lingo around the world. It's starting to work. Women are not risk averse. Women are risk aware. They do their homework. This is positive. They look at the details. They take their time making an investment decision, but they do take calculated risk. And once they become clients of anyone's, they are the most loyal clients you can possibly have. So here's my geeky math equation that I came up with, that if you can get a female customer interested, which involves having those conversations about her ideas, about her plans, about her life design, all of that, if she's interested in what you're talking about and you can find out what her values are, from there, she will invest and take risk along with the opportunity. But your job, if you're an advisor, is to align the opportunities with what you know about that woman and what motivates her. Make selling a heck of a lot easier if you do it that way. It kind of closes itself. Now, trends. What am I seeing? This is the fun part of, uh, really fun part of what I do, because I get to hear a lot of things that may, you may have heard of some of them for sure. And also, please send me anything that you, if you can connect with me, I'd really appreciate it, because that's how I find out about what's going on. Okay, so this is a big trend. When I started out in the investment industry in 1990, I was on a trading desk, foreign currency, institutional sales, and nobody would talk to me, men or women. It was just, you know, cutthroat, figure it out, lady. You know, you're new on the desk, ask, I'd ask some questions. They'd give me like one word answers. It was just like that. I'd go home and cry, you know, I eventually figured out how to do it. But the environment was definitely, because there were very few women at that time, we were not friendly. It was highly, highly competitive, and you didn't want anyone to know what you knew. It was unsupportive, and that wasn't just my environment. I think it was more or less across the board. But I'm happy to say I'm not sure about trading rooms because I don't work in one right now, but I think across the board what we're seeing is now the trend is definitely, we, we get it, we get why we need to support each other, and this is key for marketing or for anything else. It is different now. When I did research, private research for Danske Bank in 2017, I interviewed 60 of their ultra high net worth female clients. Very interesting year. They wanted me to find out what do their clients want from their bank, from their investment firm. And I found out a lot of things. But one of the interesting things is they didn't want big splashy events. They were tired of that kind of thing. They, they were able to entertain themselves. They have, they're very wealthy women. They didn't need to be invited to all of these events. They were particularly irritated by events that linked money or investing to makeup or nail polish. I heard so many funny things like, but serious, like I don't want a, my bank telling me about my nail polish or how to be happy or anything. I want to talk about, you know, investments, even though they're women. Ha, huh, interesting. So <laughs> what they did want is this kind of, remember the old literary salons and this sort of 10 to 12 women talking, do a deep dive on an investment topic of some sort. Very interesting. So the bank started to incorporate that. Far more effective because women want to share with each other. Assuming they're all intelligent, they're going to have a dynamic conversation and they're probably going to invest a lot more because they're going to convince each other. We understand it. Here's why we're doing it. It's interesting. So this is other, obviously you all know this is huge because with women it's all about relationships and connections and the stats are higher for female users of social media. Taking that one step further, SAS, the global firm or SAS, whatever you call it, uh, issued this report. You should have a look for it because it's really good. 
it talks about how brands, yes, they're targeting women today, but brands are also targeting women's networks. They're looking for their BFF, the best friend forever. Why? Because women talk to each other. And so if you can get her and her network involved on a social network of some sort, you're, you're going to get traction with that woman from a marketing standpoint. Here's a very good example of this. Uh, I met this lady, Sandra Lindquist. She's now Sandra Bourbon in Sweden um, five years ago. I was giving a talk for the NASDAQ stock exchange, and because it was NASDAQ, they were trying to get more people interested. So at the end of my talk, I was saying, so if you're not currently investing, the best way is to just get started, get practice, and just go out and buy a stock. And I was saying, just promise me, everybody, it was a women's event, go out tomorrow and buy a stock, let me know how you do. Any company, hopefully one you're interested in, you might follow it more. So this lady was an industrial engineer and she was sitting there and she said, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. I heard from her um, a couple of weeks later and she had said, you know, you said buy something you're interested in and I'm interested in gender equality in Sweden and I couldn't find a stock. This was 2015. She was looking for a fund. She couldn't find a fund. Gender equality funds did not exist back then. So she decided to do her own research, smart lady, no business experience, doesn't matter. She found 10 companies with gender equal management. So she bought those 10 companies, put it together in her little portfolio. Guess what happened? Two years later, that group of 10 companies had outperformed the S&P 500. Because of social media, she kept tweeting every month how her portfolio was doing of gender equal companies. And eventually, Business Insider wrote about her, put her on the cover and said, the Swedish amateur who's outperforming the S&P 500 with her feminist approach to stock picking. Amazing. And then the story gets better. She decided, I don't want to be an industrial engineer anymore. This is too important. I've got to change the world. So she now has an analytics firm, guess what, with rankings of gender equal companies. She's selling it to banks. It's going really well. Another great story from the US. Uh, these are all people I know, so it's fun for me to, to share these. Uh, Jane Barrett was head of a global advertising firm, big firm working out of New York for years and years and years. She was in Whole Foods one day in 2009, I think it was, shopping, and she thought, ah, oh, seems like everyone in my neighborhood is into this kind of healthier organic food now. How interesting, I should really buy Whole Foods stock. So she bought, bought Whole Foods, uh, went up huge for the next few years. Along the way, she kept thinking, well, that worked out very well for me financially. Maybe I should buy some other things ar around the house, like things I do business with, like my Apple or my, you know, uh, Colgate or Procter & Gamble stock, whatever. So she just decided to start buying the company she already did business with as, as a house person. And that was just a great way for her to get started investing. So then the penny dropped with her when she decided, you know, the investment industry should do something with this, make this very clear communication, a way to get started investing in buying the companies you already do business with. So she started a firm and they have an algorithm where they actually check and analyze your credit card statements over the past few years. And they tell you, here's the 10 top companies you're already supporting. And so if you want to get started investing, just buy those 10. We can't guarantee how the stock prices will do, obviously. However, it's a way to get started. And another person who quit their big career in advertising founded this platform, Goldbean, $50 a year, really, really attractive to millennials and women to get started. And then what happened is they built advice around it. So you've got your 10, you're learning from those, and then you learn how to build a diversified portfolio that might actually perform over the long term. She just sold this platform for a lot of money. Couldn't happen to a nicer person. And you know what? This is, this is what happens sometimes with these big ideas. And it's, it's so fulfilling. So, you know, if you were the investment advisor for one of these women with these ideas and you've talked to them about it over the years and they have a relationship with you and they trust you, 
guess who they're going to trust with that large amount of money when they finally sell, sell that business? I love this story too. I just have a couple more. This one's a Canadian startup, Volio. They're now trading on the stock exchange. Um, this was founded by a man and he decided there was an opportunity with women with investment clubs because he'd, le he'd read a lot of research. His name is Thomas Beatty and he'd read a lot of research about the investment clubs of the past and how women were really into them, but they seem to have gone out of fashion. So he's developed online investment clubs. 46% of his users are women. And what they do is they share thoughts about the portfolio and then they invest as a group. It's like a pool of money. And so interestingly, what a woman will do, he said, the men will probably have one investment club. Women will have multiple investment clubs. So they might have one with their family. We're going to buy this stuff together. And then with their friends, they might do some riskier, adventurous things. And then it could be with work colleagues as sort of a, a company competition of sorts. So it's a very, very interesting way. Uh, Christy Ross in Chicago, uh, options trading, took something as sophisticated as options trading and made it accessible to the everyday person. All she does is they have tutorials with trades of the week, all of the strangles, straddles, whatever you want, made simple. The person on the video is always just some normal looking person that you would interact with on a daily basis. Very successful platform, tastytrade.com if you're interested. So the trends, pretty much all of them that I'm seeing, and it's because of this beautiful mix of digital apps, ideas, motivated women, all kind of coming together and women inspiring and sharing with each other. So this retail investing gap, these are stats from, um, I can't remember the source, but it's in my, it's actually in my paper. Uh, long time ago, 60% of men invested in the US equity market, 40% women. So a huge gap, 20 points. During the crisis, it was about a six percentage point gap. Things shifted. <laughs> Over the last few years, four percentage point gap. So we are really close to nothing gap. And I think if I've convinced you of what I've been seeing with social trading platforms and women encouraging other women to invest, I don't think we're gonna have a gap at all by 2025 even. So I'm, I'm very excited about this. And so this to me is the future of investing. I've seen it develop and evolve over the last 10 years and so we're going to be doing some more celebrating around this topic soon. So thank you. That's my over kind of overall view. And I'd love to interact, have some questions, chat. But please do connect with me on I'm I'm always sharing articles. I do write for the Enterprising Investor for CFA Institute on my favorite topic and some other things. So if you have ideas, things that you think I should write about or just want to share research perspective, I've kept in touch with some people from last year and it's been very fruitful. So thank you all for your attention and I look forward to continuing the conversation. No questions? Too nice out. Yes. Perhaps any pattern you see between women, men and women um, with respect to big ideas and implementation of that? Uh, see, this is the thing. This is the thing. I have not studied men. So, <laughs> so I can't, like, I, I only like to talk about research based things. I mean, I can go anecdotal. What do I think? Like anybody in this room would have an opinion, but I'm sort of the expert on women and finance. I've had clients, I was a portfolio manager for 25 years. Did they implement their big ideas? You know, I honestly, I don't know. I, I, off the top of my head, most of the male clients I worked with had already made their money when they became a client. So I actually don't know. I never asked them how long did it take to, I should have asked them that. It would have been a good question in retrospect. But so I don't know. I think we need to do that research. Maybe someone else could answer this, like Peter. Well, From a male perspective, because you're dealing with men too. Yeah, and one reason we stayed in contact since last year was um, 
that there is research being done, for instance, at the University of Zurich of, of attitude and risk mm -hmm. behavior and, and the, the gender differences. Um, and the research I was aware of basically said there are differences, but they are not that big. And actually, the bigger differences are within gender. gender. So it's not something like you don't need to do this and then it's like that. So That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have heard that too from a criminology professor. She said they had seen this research that there were more differences within genders than between genders, yeah. which makes sense to me. Yeah. So it's more or less more ab about communication, I think, which is why I'm, st I'm spending a lot of time on that. I saw one observation. It's, it's interesting also when you look at the gender diversity in, in this presentation now here. Yes. That it's, you know, why aren't there more men? I don't know. I mean, you, you're basically teaching business. Converted. I mean, yeah. probably most of you guys here know what, how to deal with women. Probably. I expected <laughs> that all, every bank would send their senior salespeople. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm working in a family office, and when we talk to the banks, and we have female clients who say, I would like to talk to a female banker. And we ask the banks, why don't you hire more female bankers? Um, and I also once worked in a bank. Um, it's not a pleasant area to work in. A little bit like your trading floor experience. When we talk to ex-banker women, they say, thank God I'm out. <laughs> and, um, I don't know how you guys are, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> I know. So that's what I mean. We need the CSI effect in finance. So I think maybe after this year, I'll try to focus more on bigger banks and getting the men in the room because I don't know how else to do that. Yeah. Making it normal. Yeah. Should be. Maybe if you call it smart people, big ideas, people would relate. You know, me, for instance, if you. Your conference that we called smart guys, big ideas, that would have been intimidated, that wouldn't have trouble. Yeah, true. <laughs> Could be, yeah. It's probably something very simple. I'll give that some thought. Yeah, uh, there's probably a way to tweak it. I remember I was giving a talk for CFA in Mauritius, and they asked me to change the title to something that would appeal to men. So I can't remember what I did. It was something like technology and the something century. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did. It, it was. <laughs> we had a lot more men, so maybe, maybe you know, I've forgotten that. So that's funny. Anybody else? Yes, Veronica. You talked a lot about the smart uh, women, but what is your de definition of a smart woman? Hmm. Good question. So well, yeah. So for me, that was just sort of a funny thing. And I do think all women are smart. I think I think all men are smart as well, to be honest. I tried to think of a way of portraying the demographic that I was going after, because if we go after women in general, that's what all the stereotypes were about. Because those women include women like my mom. She's dead now, but she, she would never have said anything positive about herself ever, whether it was with money or anything. She was told to be at home and listen to what my father told her, take his money and buy groceries, all of that. And there's a whole generation of that. It doesn't make them unsmart, but they certainly weren't developed, unfortunately. So I'm trying to go, this is a demographic that's quite deliberate. I'm interviewing these highly accomplished, usually very well-educated women, so that we can share positive stories. Because I don't want to share any more of those old stories because they're not helpful. We've already had a world that looked like that. I'm going after this, and it's probably 20% of women or, or maybe less. So just for guidance, guide us forward. How, how did you get so confident? How come you're not intimidated by money? Teach the rest of us how to move ahead. And so I call them smart women, but obviously we're all smart women. And my mom was really smart too, and, and that's partly what drives me. I'm sad, but, you know, that she didn't get to do much, really. Thank you.
you also ask about how long it took to implement the idea? Yes, that was one of my slides in the very beginning. Um, that was the interest. It's in the it's in the paper, but it um, was shocking to me that uh, the majority, I think, it was two thirds, started immediately. But how long it took? After oh, after that, I'm sorry. Um, I did ask, and I didn't get enough of a, a common answer, and it was a lot of sort of evasive stuff because many are works in progress and that type of thing. So I don't really have a number, um, but I would say like a year to eighteen months. So yeah. Uh, and uh, I suppose you look a bit at the ratio of public you see some very pattern between US, Europe, or where were the limitations? Ah. Oh. Interesting. So I went every year. I don't go to the exact same countries every year. It depends on a lot of different things. Um, but I've covered basically now over the 10 years about 32 countries. So I've been not everywhere, but almost uh, haven't been to Pakistan yet. So I'm thinking um, almost everywhere. Uh, the differences continue to be uh, there are some more progressive places. And I do think this is more about social media than even the place, interestingly, and how quickly they embraced social media. So that was Sweden as a front runner. Uh, Singapore, young women driving that through social and just way ahead of the men. And even when we look at the stats on how many CFA charter holders there are globally, uh, the women much higher in China, Southeast Asia. So. Culturally, absolutely, but also social media making that even more, you know, picking up that momentum. So, yeah, but it's culture a lot still that drives it. Yes. Did you ever do research about like smart women realizing they are smart? Like, <laughs> I feel like there are a lot hmm. of highly educated women, next generation, even from clients or from, from friends, which have exactly the profile, but don't think they are these people. I love that idea. I have not done that, and I think I should. I think you've just given me a great topic. <laughs> that's actually a great topic. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Yes, because when I talk to people, I've, I've often noted in my writing that women tend to be, even the smartest that I've met, tend to be a bit self-deprecating and they use language that isn't so great about themselves. And I've seen that as an issue. And I always now encourage women. That's part of that. We're risk aware, not risk averse. You're good. This is a skill. It's excellent. Um, so that's one side of it. But what you're talking about is a different side of it. They may not even know they're smart. Like how many of us knew we were smart right away? I don't know. <laughs> it's great. I love that. There Thank are you. So many reasons for the mentalism. Yeah. Thank God, you didn't fall into the same habit like your mom. No, exactly. A generation of women were probably brought up like this. And you go one way or the other, I guess. This out of uh, basically your DNA takes. Yeah. And, and we in consulting deal a lot with women, and they know that they don't know. Whereas the male, simply driven by testosterone, thinks they can do everything and don't even get close to smart ones. Well, and that's why also the female bankers don't live long in those circles because it's they, frustrating. It's frustrating and it's simply a, a clash of attitude which rarely goes well. Well, it's hard because I've had that where you're sitting with a male and female client and the male might be just saying all these things like he knows everything and I'm there going, actually, you're completely wrong. That's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. But you can't say it either because his wife's sitting there and it's really hard. It's a hard job. The, the psychology of dealing with customers is one of the hardest jobs there is with money, right? Yeah. Yes. So um, I would, I'd like to ask, is that the same situation globally? And there some advantages compared to men in this area? I think it's very interesting because I, I first noticed that when I was doing the research for Danske Bank, because again, this segment is ultra high net worth. So maybe you could say 
they have so much money, they can change the world because all of their needs are already taken care of. But when, when I surveyed these 60 women, 96% of them said they would put all of their wealth in ESG-related investment products. 96% is fairly high. Um, when I did research for State Street last year, I interviewed 60 CEOs, male and female, and we talked a lot about ESG. And that was cultural because if I was in Israel, they'd say, what are you talking about? Man or women, didn't matter. Uh, no, we just want to make money. And then you'd go somewhere like, uh, you know, uh, Copenhagen, and they'd say, oh, very interesting. Yes, we're very focused on ESG. So with men and women, I would say a lot of it is the culture. Um, but certainly any, any surveys or what I've done on behalf of any other banks, women do like ESG or would like to be shown ESG opportunities. That's a big problem. A lot of companies aren't even showing them any opportunities. They don't know where to invest. Still, that's changing, but that's a, definitely a trend. Um, but that goes back to even my research, Rich Thinking, which is women prefer to invest in causes and concerns that matter to them. And it's, yeah, they want to make money, but if it's a difference between one percentage point or maybe something, they'll choose, they'll choose the, the investment that makes more sense to them. Yes, exactly, exactly. So we need all of it. I'd be interested in the topic of grit. Uh, you, you talked about smart women, big ideas. Uh, as we know from the entrepreneurial space, ideas are effectively a dime a dozen. It's, it's really a question of the implementation. Uh, so did that uh, topic, uh, can you really address that? Uh, yes. I think, you know, I, I really, it's always, this always happens. I try to only have one question so that I can get uh, a new sort of an easy interview and an open-ended conversation because I get a lot of other stuff in those kinds of conversations. I'd like to go back at this topic and ask what happened after execution because I don't know the answer. But throughout the conversation, certainly people said, all that matters is I had to get it done. Like I had to actually execute on the idea, otherwise there's no point. So anybody they talked to did actually execute on their idea and two thirds of them immediately. So I think that was very encouraging. What happened next? I'm not sure. I mean, a lot of these people spent over $100,000. I'd like to know. It'd be fairly easy for me to go back and ask. Barbara, I think from my perspective, I work with clients in, in China, most of them are unicorn or future unicorn, and my clients are men and women. I think an interesting question for you, as a research on a broad basis, is what happens if your idea fails? Do you pursue the second idea or third idea? Because what I learned from talking with these people is that most of them never made it to something very big. Without a lot of failures. Such and a good point. In their first idea, they actually invested for everything that they had. Yeah. So after investing everything they had, and failure, they had to start with, you know, not just zero, but something minus. Yes. And yet they went about pursuing something else. And that's where they became from nothing to a company. Ah. It's so funny that you bring this up because I'm on contract right now for three months doing a project interviewing 35 CEOs across only Canada, entrepreneurs, to inform this Canadian entrepreneur report. And I won't say who's sponsoring it because it's not out yet. Um, so I've been doing these deep interviews with CEOs. And just last week, you know, one of them said to me, anybody that's successful as an entrepreneur has had three, four, or five big bad starts and they've had to start all over again and then they finally you know get the one thing that works so these personalities are amazing Women, be willing to take that all of the stuff you yeah about, yeah after failing once or twice yeah i think so i, th I think they would yeah my, but you know my well half of the very small. half of the 35 i'm interviewing are women 
and they're the same. It's just I'm very curious about that question. I'll send you this report once it's published. Okay, yeah. I get to work on a lot of interesting stuff. Fun. Anybody else? Yeah. I, I just would like to ask you for your thoughts. You know, just very recently Forbes published the list of the company. Yes. <laughs> you know, with leaders. And there's only one woman. Uh, yeah. They obviously have a very particular methodology. I would say. Well, that, well, it's insane. Giving yeah. what you've talked about, like, uh, and, and the development we've seen in the last couple of years is almost like. It's insane. First of all, I didn't read it because I thought, found it was so offensive. And I read one retort on Twitter with their defense of it being something to do with um, all data. And, you know, we had a certain, you know, measurements that they all fell into. It's completely ridiculous and should not be discussed. <laughs> <laughs> Forbes. Most innovative leaders. 100, yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. I wouldn't take it seriously. Let's just say that. I don't think they'll be able to either. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, a lot of good questions, and also I've picked up some ideas for my next research. Yay. That helps me a lot. Sometimes I lie awake going, what else am I going to ask? Because I love doing it, and I always need new questions. So thank you all.